So this time last year, I was up in Pennsylvania. It was the first time I had been invited to attend the, the theological roundtable that um, is kind of hosted by Harold Eberly. And while I was there, I had the privilege of meeting two amazing people. One of them is in the room today. Uh, the other one, Doug, has been here, Doug Johnson, and um, uh, at some point he's going to speak, but I just haven't managed to pull that one off yet, but he and his wife do appear. The second person that I ran into is the person that's with us today, Larry, and one of the, one of the things that, uh, I don't know if it's age-related, um, <laughs> Not referring to Larry at this point, I'm referring to me, but I don't know if it's age related or not. But one of the things I've, I've discovered or where I've come to or arrived or whatever is I've realized that in life, I don't have to know everybody. Now, for an introvert, that's reassuring. But... Like, sometimes, you know, it's like, well, you, you have to be involved with everybody. You know, if you're loving people and doing all this, you do all that stuff. And, and, and the answer is no. But what I have realized is that... <laughs> what I've realized is, if I just go about life with the Father, He positions people in my path that he will highlight and when I let him pick my friends he really brings some treasures into my life and I also realize that he has chosen uses me chosen me he's chosen you he uses me to be a treasure to somebody else it's reciprocal it's not a one-way thing well while we were there at the round table, I had the privilege of having sharing a meal with Larry and, and Doug and some others around the table. And as we got talking, I just knew, here's a treasure. Because we started talking about things that both of us were connecting with. Um, and it was an easy conversation. So when we left, I said, I, I need to be intentional about this. I want to build this relationship. And so we've they, they, there's Larry and his wife, Vicki, and they pastor a church out in Colorado, so I can't just call him up and say, oh, you want to have lunch today? So I have to be a little more intentional about that, but be that as it may, that's come to pass. And I, I, from the first time I met Larry, I was like, I need to introduce you to the tribe. And it's been just a joy in my heart when he said they could be here and, and to introduce him to y'all and have him just be here in our midst and with Vicki being able to come along, that's an added blessing. And so I want to get to give a real house welcome to Larry and Vicki McKnight. And Larry's going to share his heart with us today and it's going to be a wild ride. Hold on. It's just going to be good. Oh, okay. Well, that was a pretty spectacular. <clears throat> Oops. Are we on yet? I got a green light. Okay. That was a pretty spectacular introduction. It, and it was true. It was true. It was true from my perspective, the same as you said, only, only more. We're sitting there sharing, talking. We were at the same table in the, in the Theology Roundtable. Um, and it was just... There we go. That'll work. It was just spectacular, and I, went, I remember going home and, and telling Vicky, man, I met this guy named Robert, and uh, we have got to get together, and what he said about intentionality is, uh, I just wish it were easier and, and simpler, because um, I felt that same intentionality, but still it was, you know, a week turned into several weeks, and a month turned into a couple of months, and so on, so when we had this opportunity, I, uh, Vicky and I took off a little bit early, and and uh, I'm only going to share the logistics of our trip so you know that we were serious about getting here. <laughs> so our services are on Friday night. And the only plane flight I could get was at 5 a.m. 
on Saturday to get here in time to make the trip up here and do all this kind of stuff. So uh, we spent the night on some deflating air mattresses in the church the night before, and my grandson <laughs> came with us so we could get to the airport by 3 o'clock. And uh, Bob, Bob rightly said, he said, that sounds more like an international flight than just one, you know, halfway across the country. And it was, it was fun. So I was totally incoherent yesterday when we got here, and they were gracious to let us take a nap before they held me accountable for anything I said. Uh, but... <laughs> It is a tremendous honor to be here. Uh, I, I pastor a church in Colorado. It's called Joyland, and it's about 10 years old, so we're in our infancy compared to you guys, as I've learned, uh, being here since 1984 or 80 in that ne neck of the woods. One of the things that I really was expecting when I came, and I've experienced it already this morning, when we first, uh, we've gone through a really, really big transition in the last year and a half. It involves selling some church property and coming into a, a whole new mission uh, and message for what we're trying to do. And um, the series that I started teaching when we moved from the location we used to be at to Colorado Springs was called Finding Your Voice in the Kingdom. And I was teaching on a few things that had to change in our thinking if we were to find our voice. And I'm sitting here worshiping with you, and I'm listening, and I'm watching the parade of people come up and hear God and share and say and speak in, in the, the song that you made come alive you know, as your own song. And I go, wow, here's a group of people that have found their voice and they are finding it because it's, it's an eternal voice, right? It's an eternal voice. And, and so I'm super excited about it. And I just was sitting there kind of soaking it in and I believe in that kind of thing. Uh, so so I'm, I'm virtually certain that you are making a deposit in our folks back in Joyland. And I'm, I'm real excited to keep, keep you guys posted on, on how that is. So thank you so much. Um, C.S. Lewis, in the, in the, I think it's the uh, book on the four loves, uh, in the chapter about friendship, he says, when you're among your friends, you always feel like you're among your betters. And I, I don't know if you know the quote, but that is exactly how I feel right now. And uh, when we were sitting there talking last night and this morning, the journey that you guys have been on, and again, this idea of your boldness and finding your voice and, and, and the poetry and the art and, and the, the beauty of the words uh, were amazing, just amazing. And... Uh, that's how I feel. But as, as Robert, you mentioned, there is a point to our lives and there's a point to our friendships and, and, and times. And so I'm going to proceed this morning as if I have something worth saying. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, I, so I'm going to, uh, we have been like you have been, and as I've learned, the more I've gotten to talk to Robert, we have been on a journey where, where one question leads to another. And uh, Robert was talking about being engaged in a study in Genesis and how it's opening doors to stuff and, and ask, you know, creating questions. A few years ago, we did that same thing. We, we went back to Genesis to start over to try to find if, if the gospel that we assumed on was the gospel that was really talked about. And if the God that was the central point to that gospel was actually the God of the Bible, and one of the characteristics that we wanted to uh, kind of attack a little bit was this assumption of, of God being angry and being offended and operating out of that offense to create a structure of, of relationship with people. And it didn't take us very long in Genesis to just track through the words in simple fashion and find out, first of all, there's no place where you can see this big, wrathful God. Just uh, two weeks ago, I had somebody share with us about a Sunday school curriculum and a little kids program, kids video, and it showed a picture of Adam eating the apple, and as soon as he took a bite of the apple, I'm saying the in quotes, right? You understand that? As soon as he took a bite of the apple, the sky turned dark, and God's voice went from being kind of a happy grandfatherly voice to a brave voice like this and it got dark and everything and I just go oh my goodness you know was, so uh, when you told me what you were thinking about studying and helping people understand I uh, I was I'm very sympathetic to it uh, we quickly found out uh, as I'm sure you know that even when Adam and Eve were were banned sent out of the garden God went out with them. He didn't stay there and establish an office in the garden where Cain had to make an appointment to come in and hear sins crouching at the door. And, and you know, it, it, so just a slow, simple reading of Scripture. And it's been characteristic of, of not only what we've been doing, what I hear that you guys are doing, and what I see everywhere I go. And um, so today, I, I know that creates instability 
when, when, when long held beliefs, uh, I, I've, I've pastored, I started pastoring when I was 19 years old. And uh, I had a little interlude, 17 year interlude in there when I was out of the pa uh, ministry officially. Uh, some prophetic stuff led to that and it was a really good time. But so I've been at this a long time. And I know that when a, a belief that is challenged that you've held for a long time, uh, you can be as progressive as you want to be. You can be as intentional as you want to be, but it does create some instability and instability can, can bite you at times. It can sneak up on you. And so I have found, um, I've experienced that a lot. And uh, as a matter of fact, the first, no, it's the second uh, theology roundtable that Harold invited me to. One of the things that he put on the invitation, I don't know if you uh, participated in that, but one of the things he put on the invitation was list two things that you believe today that you didn't believe five years ago. And when I got there, I was laughing because I said, <laughs> It would have been easier to answer the question if you had said, list two things that you believe today that you did believe <laughs> five years ago. Only because, in my experience, the Holy Spirit is rehabilitating our, especially in the Western culture, our image of the Father. Because it's been institutionalized and it, it was never created as an institution. The, 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 this is not designed to create an institution. It's okay to, to use it to guide your institutional exploration and thought, but this is designed to create a relationship. Yeah. And, and a relationship involves knowing and it involves unknowing and it involves trust in the areas that you don't yet know and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, I'm excited about, about sharing a little key that I found and that we found at Joyland that helps uh, stabilize or contain or steward is a better word maybe, steward those insecurities that come from exploring new things. Because it, the alternative is to stop exploring new things. Yeah. And that is an unthinkable, that's an unthinkable option, not only because we don't already know everything, but we never will know everything. Uh, one of the little principles that's guided me uh, my whole life and kept my heart open is that God is infinite. <coughs> that means he doesn't have boundaries. We're finite. That means we do have boundaries. So just by the nature of infinite versus finite, there are reference points in God that are true that of necessity are outside our boundaries that we cannot know. But those true reference points influence the God we know within our boundaries. So you have to stay open. You have to stay open. And uh, once somebody sees it in that light, uh, a lot of times I'll use an illustration on the board to talk to people like that. I'll have a, a bunch of dots. You know, the dots will be all over like the, the projection or whatever. And then you draw a little circle here, and that's our finiteness, and this is God's infiniteness. And so what is the relationship between the reference point that's outside a truth, is what I'm saying when I say a reference point, a truth about God, that is outside our circle? Well, we don't know it, but it can have influence. So all of a sudden there can be things in our relationship and in our life that are influenced by a point that we can't reference, but they happen to us, and we experience them. And I think one definition of those sorts of experiences are mysteries. I think that's what the Bible talks about with a mystery. A mystery doesn't mean something doesn't have an explanation. It means you just don't know it. <laughs> you just don't know it. And it's natural. And then one of the verses that I lean on really heavy is at the end of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, which, if you remember, is the love chapter. So when Paul's talking about love, he gets to the point where he says, but we know in part. And we prophesy in part. And so I keep trying to encourage my peers, and I keep trying to do this myself, get comfortable with the part you don't know, especially the part about God. So now what is a relationship? Now that reference point isn't connected to me. It's not in me where I can refer to it, but it is connected to every other reference point with God. So when something that is within my realm and is revealed in Scripture, like John says, uh, God is love. Well, that is connected to that reference point. They're not going to be opposites. There's not an instance in which God is going to be love in this revealed world that's within my reference points, and behind the scenes, he's going to be hate. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So that means even though I don't know what all these reference points might be, they're not darkness in, in, in the way that talks about. See what I'm saying? So there's a consistency even though we don't know stuff. 
And I've been searching for ways to help people find that because I feel like this big transition we've gone through at Joyland is um, instead of just trying to offer a better Christian experience to people who are all, this is just being really honest, okay? Instead of concentrating on offering a better, more contemporary, more exciting, more prophetic, more, more relational experience uh, of Christianity for people who are already born again but discouraged and bummed out by their own church. So, you know, I, I, it, it, we're not trying to do that anymore. <laughs> what we're trying to do is we're trying to reach out in the understanding that there is a light in Christ. We're going to read about it in a second. There's a light that Christ's life was, and that light has enlightened the heart of every man. Now, I don't know exactly how to talk about that or what it means, but I do know this, that every person in this room, which of course is obvious, but every person out there in the streets that we go to, or recently I was in Uganda, you were in Kenya, every person you see there, there has been some sort of an actual investment of the life, the incarnate life of Christ, in their hearts. It's not something that just happens when you say a prayer. It's not something that just happens when you wake up to it. Uh, you, can, you can reject it. You can not know it. But the scripture says the darkness didn't overcome it. That this light is enlightening the heart of every man. And then the other thing that has been a big shift for us uh, in the last, this last section of ministry in my life, last 10 years, in the last five or so, is I began to take seriously uh, when Peter was describing the day of Pentecost, and he said, um, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. What Joel said was, in that day, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. So the qualification, and, and I used to be uh, an Assemblies of God. I was ordained Assemblies of God. And having the spirit poured out on us was our distinctive. And we didn't share it with everybody. <laughs> They had, to, they had to be like us for, for us to think that. Now, that never really set well with me, but it was the fact. It was a fact in our theology and a fact in our denomination. But now I see that what the, the qualification that the, the, the Lord spoke through Joel for the outpouring of the Spirit was that you had to have flesh. Well, that isn't much of a distinctive, but it's at least something we can get our hands on. But the beauty of that is, is when, when you're... Uh, when you're praying for revival or when you're praying for something to break out, you already have a fifth column in the lives of everybody that you could possibly get to. Yep. Because the light of the life of Jesus has enlightened the heart of every man, is what it says, and the Spirit's been poured out on all flesh. So you have those two components. And now we're not just, we're not just crying across the chasm. I loved what you said in that, in that word, that these these chasms, these divisions, these things that separate us, God has come across. Yes. Yes. God has come across. Yes. And he found the core of that in the Kidron Valley uh, when, when he was confronted and arrested. And there's, there's no deeper place of darkness to go than political uh, abuse, religious abuse, personal betrayal, and abandonment. Yes. I mean, that is as deep as the roots of darkness have gotten in our lives. And everything else is kind of explained from that. I know some of the times it, it's hard to make that connection, but I just believe that that's where we're at. So anyhow, that's, that's where I'm at. And, and, and what I want to share with you, and I know that's where you guys are, are at and you're exploring and the Holy Spirit's leading you in this way. And so I'm going to share what is my bedrock security blanket when facing changing beliefs and the instability and sometimes insecurity that comes from that. So let me start, if you could, uh, in the book of Hebrews. And then I've got a little illustration about how you, uh, uh, there's a temptation to think you've already, you know, oh, yeah, I understand all this and I'm, I'm going strong. But even at every stage in our life, we can slip back. And, and so I'm going to show you something in my life that, ha that happened too. But Hebrews chapter 1 starts out like this. It says, God, after he had spoke long ago to them, to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. Now, I'm reading out of the New American Standard. I do my primary study out of the New American Standard. Uh, I do that partly because I, I like the, the clarity of it. I do it partly because they're, they work pretty good for tenses. But this is one of the most uh, inadequately translated verses that I've found in the, 
<laughs> in the New American Standard. And, and, and it's over some really, really small things. Uh, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers uh, in the prophets, that's an interesting thing to think about. He spoke in the prophets. So when you get up and give a word like that, that is, from the very beginning, there's an in component. And so it's more than just your word. This is more than just hopefully my word. This is something that, that each of us have the privilege to listen to and hear the voice of the Lord in. Okay, So I like that. That's good um, in many ways. But in these last days has spoken to us in his son. Now, the, the idea of his, the word, there's nothing in the Greek that corresponds to that. So what it actually says, and, and you can tell that is sometimes translations are italicized or whatever, but you can, you can tell, or, or the, the way this would be translated if they didn't add that word for clarity, and certain translations do this, they'll say in a son, or more specifically without any kind of uh, uh, article leading into it, he's spoken to us in son. And so that prompted us to understand, uh, or to think about the idea that, well, if I think of son like obviously a person, then I'm going to be okay because I'm going to hear what Jesus says. But if I think of it like a language, that's going to force me to not lean on this as if it were a telephone conversation first spoken by God, given to Jesus, and then given from Jesus to us. But that the Father is actually speaking in the demonstration of the Son's life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, you can check that out if you like go to a lexicon or something and see that it's not there. And then it also says, in the last days he spoke to us in Son... So I'm encouraging our people to learn Sunnese. We don't actually know what it is yet, but it's a good course of language study. <laughs> and when you start thinking about it, it just means that Jesus is in the forefront of our minds as we're reading through the scripture. And since it's linked back to the prophets and it's linked back to the old times in various ways, previous days, then that means that this whole anxiety thing over the Old Testament presenting a different picture of God can be, can be resolved dramatically by just keeping Jesus' mind all the time. And since it's not always obvious, then you, you rely on the fact that the same Holy Spirit that uh, lives today lived then, and you can just ask, Holy Spirit, show me Jesus. Show me Jesus in the flood. Show me Jesus in Sodom and Gomorrah. Show me Jesus in the, in the numbering and the plagues. Show me, you know, and it, it's a, it, it's an, sometimes it's a super easy answer to hear, and other times you have to you know, put your big boy pants on and... And, and, and look, but it's not manipulative. It's at the core of what's going on. In one moment, he spoke through prophets and all this kind of stuff for one age, and then now he spoke through Jesus. And then there's one more thing in here I just want to share with you that was interesting as I pulled it out. In these last days, he's spoken to us in Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. That word world there is the strangest translation in my mind in that verse because it's the word aeon. It's not the word cosmos. And cosmos is very properly translated word. Aeon should be translated age. Yes. So what this says is interesting. It, it, it reveals a progression. I always wondered why the emphasis on, and through whom he made the world, was that emphasis trying to say, well, we usually think of God or the Father as the creator or something like that, but really Jesus was the creator. Is that what the emphasis was? Or, but now that I understand the world is age, there's a whole new thing that opens up. It means that the, the apostle or whoever's writing this is talking about here was an age in which God spoke through various people in various ways. Now, here is an age in which he's spoken through us in son, in, in, in the, the actual word of the Father, which is the son. Jesus. And so now here's another age coming, but there's qualities of this speaking in son that isn't going to change because this is the new covenant. This is the, the place we're at. And so we have an expectation of the future coming. And I know for a lot of our folks and stuff, even in, in, in my life, I'm getting older. I'm just, I think I'm about six months younger than you. So watch out. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, after uh, we'll have a dance off or something. That might be fun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in private, a totally private affair. Uh, anyway, you, you know how a lot of times the future seems foreboding. It seems kind of like a, a steamroller or a juggernaut that's just coming, and you don't know what's going to happen, and you're constantly sort of bracing yourself and trying to get your ducks in a row so you can face what's coming. 
But what this says is that it was through Jesus himself that these ages were created. So we can have the expectation that they are going to have the, the, the imprints of who he is, his redemptive nature, his loving nature, the fact that he is God, that he's love, light, spirit, fire. So our expectation should be a redemptive expectation of the future. And then it becomes a thing that keeps giving us a second chance in grace, another chance in grace, as opposed to this thing that we dread. So words make a difference is all I'm trying to say. And so when we open this up, but the main point, obviously, so that was just me on a lot of things I'm passionate about. The main point here is that at one time God spoke to us in a variety of ways, and they're recorded in here. And now he's spoken to us in his son. And the record of the life of the son is recorded in here but he's still speaking to us by his son, okay? So Jesus needs to be more of a focus than Amos. Does that make sense? And that's not to take away from Amos, but you won't really understand what God was saying through or in Amos. Oh, the other thing about the in. When you read the prophets, you're not necessarily reading something that God dictated like to an amanuensis and saying it, but you're reading something that God did in a life and spoke in a life, and then that life speaks it out. Yeah. And that, that's not to take away from the, the, the value of it, certainly, or the literacy of it, but when you read Daniel's experiences under Nebuchadnezzar, you're reading God working in Daniel yeah. on behalf of the Babylonian people and the children of Israel. When you read about uh, Nehemiah bringing the people back, it's not that, that every step he took and every brick they made was God forcing them to make a brick. It was God in them being revealed. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's one scripture. It, it, it just means that now it's time to put the emphasis on the son that he spoke through. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, let's go back to the Gospel of John. Uh, the, the beginning... Before I read this, let me, let me, I, let me uh, share something that I, I wrote a note on here and I almost forgot to say it. So a person that I greatly respect, a teacher, a theologian, says something that helps put what I'm trying to say to you today in, in, uh, in context. He says, one conversation that you'll never hear in heaven is two people standing there talking going, wow, we really overestimated Jesus' role in all of this. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? It, it, it's a great way to sum up what's in my heart. We will never, ever hear that statement with anybody that's actually there seeing what's going on. Jesus is the centerpiece of, of heaven. He's the centerpiece of the new covenant. He's the centerpiece of the revelation of the gospel. And he's the centerpiece of God now speaking to people. So I wanted to get that in. All right, now back to the, the gospel of John then. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We're going to go down to one more verse here in John 1. But again, I just want to, I want to share with you the, the sort of utter significance of Jesus that's pointed out in this verse. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's important. That's cool. And that uh, fuels our, our Trinitarian thought and stuff like that, which is a big part of my life. And the Word was God. So now all of a sudden, when we're dealing with the Word, we're not dealing with a projected voice that is distinct from God. We are dealing with the voice that is God. Yeah. This is how God speaks to us. So this makes Hebrews make a ton of sense. That in the times past, before this voice, and there was no time past when it wasn't the word, but it was time past prior to the incarnation, prior to our ability to, as John says in his first letter, handle and touch the word of life. There was this apparent distinction, this apparent difference between what God said and who God was. But that gap was closed in Jesus. And so now we have the permission and we have the responsibility and in in, in everything to, to not really think about God very much without thinking about Jesus. Because to do so subjects us to a lot of speculation and a lot of philosophy and a lot of outside influence. Uh, and and it, it, was, it has been so since the beginning. Um, 
the thing that the serpent spoke to Eve was God did not. And so there is an encapsulation of the, of the demonic strategy of the ages, the Antichrist strategy of the ages, is that God is not who he says he is. He's not like he says. And that's what took possession of humanity, actually. And that is what was corrected when, when Jesus came in the incarnation. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so uh, uh, Jesus is of critical importance because he is God. He was with God in the beginning. And then it says this, all things came into being through him. And to emphasize it, John goes, apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That means, among other things, or a way to think about that, among other things, is that there is no thing, no situation, no circumstance, or no possibility that, it, that, it, it, that could make its way into reality that is not in Jesus and, 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 and does not owe its existence in a way to him. And I know that can get complicated when you're talking negative things, positive things, sin, and all this kind of stuff. It just means that what, what John is establishing is that you don't have to look elsewhere for the origin of created things. You don't have to look elsewhere for the origin of relational things. Um, we might have to look elsewhere for the origin of sin, because sin is a, a veering away from those things. But even, even if you... Even if you want to talk about sin, and I, I can't speak as an expert, <laughs> I can speak as an expert on sin, but not about how to think about it. Um, even if you, if you make sin a starting point of a contemplation, you will quickly be able to see the perversion that it is from what God made through Christ. Yeah. And you can, you can trace back to how it got twisted. And, and that, and then if you think that way, instead of making sin a gigantic issue, it becomes a twisted thing of a of a real thing. Then it's a lot easier to see people getting delivered and getting out of it and stuff. So, uh, so all of creation and all of the stuff we face is in Christ. That makes him pretty important. Then it talks about life. It says, "In him was life, and the life was the light of men." Uh, and that light shines in the darkness. Now, as we go on down here in verse 9, it says, and this is where I mentioned earlier, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Now, I don't, again, I don't know how to make a case for that, but what I, what I can make a case against not believing is that the light came into the world and didn't enlighten the heart of every man. Because the Bible says it did. So even if I can't fully comprehend how it is when I'm thinking about a, a, a sex traffic person or a, a, a person that, that murders and abuses children, and I, I do, I have a hard time understanding you know, where the light is in there, how deeply is it buried. But, what, but if I acknowledge that it's there, then I, I do have an issue of, of cover or burial or hiddenness, and, and I'm not, I, I don't have the leisure of just dealing with that person as if they were of no importance if they were not really a full creature, as if they were outside someplace in, in their own realm of creation. So it's really important to, to, to think this way, even if you don't have answers, and to embrace the, embrace the, uh, the mystery of it and the confusion of it. Um, yeah, there's another passage. Let me jump back real quick. I wasn't planning to go back there. But in Hebrews, if we go down a little bit in chapter 2, it talks about how uh, that the earth was subject to man. In verse 5, it says, He didn't subject the angels of the world to come concerning which we are speaking, but one testified somewhere, what is man? And you know the passage. Then it goes on down here toward uh, verse 8, I think. It says, You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subject to him. So that helps me understand why b believing that the Scripture says that the light of Christ has been enlightened the heart of every man and that the Spirit's poured out on all flesh, that some people show virtually no evidence of that. Okay? Because it says right here, but we do not see him who was made a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering. But now we see him. So we don't see all this fully manifest, but we do see Jesus. And so once again, our, our gaze is directed back to Jesus. Um, down here a little bit further. Now I'm back. Sorry, I'm jumping around. Now I'm back here in the first chapter of John. In verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we saw his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And then this is the part I want us to focus on. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Now that's another one of those truths that you have to decide whether you're going to believe or you're going to wait until you see the evidence of it. Of his fullness we have all received. And I just always remind our folks, what is the point of being a believer? It's to believe the things that you don't see. <laughs> and so here we are. We're confronted with a truth that is so astonishing and so contrary to the sort of surface evidence that we see that we have to say, no, I don't believe this, what it says in Scripture. I believe what I see with my eyes. Now, you guys, we wouldn't do that on other behavioral issues or things that we're supposed to say. But when it comes to the intrinsic value and the success of the word becoming flesh and what went on at the gospel. Anyway, the thing that this wrestling match with belief has helped me to, to, to see is that for much of our country and in much of the church, especially in the Western world, we have such a tiny view of what was accomplished on the cross and the gospel that Jesus died to give you an opportunity. And so you better take that opportunity. And that isn't the truth, I don't think. I think Jesus died to completely shift the relationship between humanity and the Creator. And that now we are in the process of carrying the message of that shift and that victory into the lives of people. And that is a whole different kind of gospel. And it allows us to approach people who are every place on the spectrum of knowing that or being completely, totally ignorant of that and, and substituting their own stuff in life for it, uh, th that gives us a whole new way to look at them yeah. and relate to them. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I can tell that you guys are geared, geared into that, you know, that, that, that you're not dividing people into the, the ins and the outs, the, the good and the bad. And, and we got in trouble grasping the division of good and bad in the first place. Why keep it going? You know, it's just like an addiction. So anyhow, um, then I want to come to this last verse, which is something that, that especially among my Pentecostal roots and uh, prophetic folks and ascension people and all this kind of stuff, it's hard to swallow. No one, this is verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. How, how many of you in the last month have said, uh, that God said, or I saw God, or you were in a prayer meeting or something. I have. I have. All right. So I'm trying to be a steward of that language, and I'm not afraid of saying that, but I just want to understand, I want people to understand what I'm actually trying to say. John says that no one has seen God at any time. Then he goes on to say, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him or exegeted him. He has pointed him out. He's revealed him. So this is just another piece of evidence that Jesus is super central, and that when we say wow, uh, I just saw the Lord doing this, and I saw the Lord doing that, I heard the Lord doing this. We are more likely than not talking about being beneficiaries of what Jesus said to, uh, was it Thomas or Philip, when he said, uh, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, So it's not that we don't have access to see God, we have access to see God through Jesus only. It's not an independent situation. Make sense? All right, so let's go to Colossians now. Colossians chapter... Uh, there's no clock in your room. Right there. Right there. Ah, there it is. Okay. Ooh, that's bad. What time am I supposed to shut up? When you're done. Are you sure? Okay. All right. One o'clock. A.M. P.M. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> you listen. That's great. All right, I just want to read this, this section because it's such a beautiful section about the centrality of Jesus. And it begins in verse 13 of Colossians chapter 1. Yeah, 13, Colossians chapter 1. I noticed this morning when Robert got up and started reading out of Ephesians 2, he didn't quote a verse. So he, he, he like I, either forgets a lot to do that or keeps you on your toes so you have to know, <laughs> know your Bible. Uh, that's a good passage, too, that, that Ephesians 2 passage. Yeah. It's, write this line. Okay, so for he rescued us from the domain of darkness 
and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then here's a very powerful line. He is the, invisible, the image of the invisible God. So when it says that no man has seen God at any time, but Jesus is the image of the invisible God, then that just cements it to me. When I'm seeing God, I'm seeing him as a result of looking at Jesus. Now, I may not know that. So, for instance, I think some of the Old Testament theophanies and stuff, they weren't aware, uh, like when God appeared to Abraham. Does that contradict what John says, or does that reveal that Jesus was visiting Abraham in a pre-incarnate form? And that's the way I prefer to think about it. I don't know if you guys are in that line of thinking, but that's how I see it. And when, and when, uh, when God was walking in the garden, uh, and there was, if there was an image there involved, I'm thinking that that's Jesus somehow being seen, uh, Yahweh. So anyway, one of the big changes that's happened in my ministry and life in the last section of ministry that I've had for about the last 10 years is I've just tried to read the scripture more slowly and let it say what it says and not necessarily edit it to conform to my already uh, established theological beliefs. And it's proven to be a wonderful thing, but it has created this kind of instability. Yes. And so I'm halfway through letting you know what created that stability. And, and if, if, you're, if you're thinking ahead, you're right if you're saying, focusing on Jesus. Not to the exclusion of the Father, not to the exclusion of images of God, but focusing on Jesus is what lines us up with the way God has chosen to reveal himself now and forevermore, it says, when you, when you get into the concepts of the new covenant and so on. So he's the, in, uh, the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. And, and for by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So you see the agreement here that Paul has with what John said at the beginning of the gospel. Again, Jesus is central. He's central to understand creation. He's central to understand time. He's central to understand heaven. He's central to understand the gospel and, and redemption. And, and then it goes on, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn, of the dead. And he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And a lot of places will will. Uh, understand that fullness. A lot of commentaries, a lot of teachers will understand that fullness to mean the fullness of the Godhead. That, that all of the diversity there is in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of the ontological existence, all of the beginnings, all of the nature, is, is, it, it pleased him that it dwell in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So, um, and then it says, uh, with everything dwelling in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And then this next verse is one that I just think is really super precious. It says, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. That is a definition of the condition of people out there. Not people who are on the outside. Not people who don't have the light of the life of Christ somehow sown in their heart. Not people who don't have the Holy Spirit interacting and poured over their flesh. They are people who are alienated in their mind. And that alienation breeds hostility in both mind and deed. And that explains some of this, you know, them giving God the finger. Because it's, it's, it's the breeding ground of that alienation. Is God separate from them? No. Are they separated from him in their mind? The answer is yes. Uh, could they experience God? Yes, they could. Do they experience God? No, they don't. I mean, they do, but they don't recognize it, even when they do. Because he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He's constantly pouring out blessing on them. He's leading them. He's wooing them. All this kind of stuff. But until that alienation is dealt with, it feels like separation. But it's a lie. It's a lie. Um, so that's, that's kind of important. And then as you, as you uh, go over to chapter 3, there's a little section that I just, again, want to emphasize Jesus. And I feel like I'm kind of AD, ADHDing it a little bit here. The real main point I'm trying to talk about is focus on Jesus. He will be the anchor and the lens and the clarity and the foundation and the stability as you move through revelation and new beliefs. 
So focus on Jesus. But here's what it says. Um, this is in verse 9. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So if we just read that slow, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Then you ask yourself a question like, so what other parts of deity don't live in him? Well, that's an easy question to answer if you take this scripture seriously. None, yeah. right? There's, there's nothing that you are going to need to encounter by God. And back to my illustration of all these infinite reference points that are beyond our boundaries, all of those are in Jesus too. Yeah. Not just the ones that are in my boundary point. Jesus didn't come here just to confirm my view of God. He came here to reveal God as God is. And that includes all those other boundaries. So now, rather than being insecure, well, maybe God's love here, but he's hate out here. No. Unless we see hate in Jesus, then we can be assured that it doesn't exist out there in that unreferenced area. And that's why energy spent relating to Jesus, studying about Jesus, thinking about Jesus. Now, the good news is the Holy Spirit is active in our life, as he is in the lives of other people, making room for us to believe in Jesus. And, uh, and this is, again, one of the simplest verses in Scripture that gets ignored a million times. You have people saying that uh, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, Jesus says in, in John 16, I think, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then they stop reading, and they step over here, and they get their index of sins and say that verse applies to these things. But it doesn't. Jesus knew that we were going to do that. He knew his disciples were vulnerable to that. So he immediately explained what he meant. He said, of sin, because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to be with the Father. And I don't fully yet know what that means, but I'm gaining ground on that one. And then of judgment, of course, not that you're going to be judged for your sins, but that the ruler of this world is cast down. So, again, Jesus is the interpreter. Jesus is the exegete. He's the revealer of who, Jesus, of who the Father is. And, and we do a great disservice. Think about that. Think how many people say, yeah, the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, and they're trying to get some poor sap to, to, to uh, review the failures in his life. And the Holy Spirit's not, he's not, not able to support that effort. Because <laughs> that's not what he's sent to do. He's sent to say, no, we, we need to understand that, that this life that's sown in you, that's been buried, you need to wake up to that. You need to give place to that. And I'm here in you to make room, as Paul says a little bit later, Ephesians 3, to make room for Christ to dwell in your hearts through faith. So it, it's, do you get what I'm saying? We can twist this stuff around if we take our eyes off Jesus and what, what he said and who he is. Um, let me, one more point before we go to the next. For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. And in the same breath, and in him... You have been made complete. There is as much evidence that that scripture about me is not true as there is that the life of Christ is not in the heart of every person out there who's being an absolute jerk. But again, meaning I present a case for my life that says I'm not complete. But again, what's the point of being a believer? It's to believe. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Or I probably get it backwards. The uh, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. This completeness, that's right. This completeness is an objective fact revealed to me by the inspired scripture in Christ about me. And so my job is to believe that. And my job is also to believe that in you. And that changes the whole conversation about how we help disciple one another how we hold one another accountable. Yep. Like, uh, you tell me then, hey, this is not who you are. Yep. Not who you are. And, and keep in mind that we're complete in him. We as people are made in his image. Jesus is the exact image of the invisible God. So Jesus is not only the person and the God, the incarnate one, the leader, the king, the friend, that we look to to see who God is. We also get to look to him to see who we are. And again, there's a lot in that I don't know, but it's something that I'm hanging on to by faith, and I'm finding it blossom into more and more actual practical reality in my life. So Jesus is just the centerpiece for, for knowing God and knowing us.
All right, last one. And this is the one that I'm gonna then jump to and share my blunder. This is in Matthew chapter 11. And it's a very intriguing, I think, a very intriguing passage of Scripture. It goes along with the idea that no one's seen God at any time. Um, Matthew 11, verse 25. It says, At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And then here's the verse that I, the section I want you to listen to. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. Wow. If you let that just speak like the natural language would mean, it means that there is an exclusive club of two individuals, so to speak, in the, in the Trinity that actually know each other. The Father knows the Son, and no one else knows the Son. And the Son knows the Father, and no one else knows the Son. Now, when I first uh, read that and thought about it in those terms, and I started trying to think of the exclusivity of that relationship, that knowledge, it freaked me out a little bit because it, it played into, uh, just for a moment or two, it played into that idea of, oh, do I know or do I, you know, what about all, you know. Here's, here's my favorite connection between two verses in the entire Bible. Um, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. It goes on to say much more. I'll give you the rest of the stuff. But think about that. This assertion of an absolutely unique relationship between the Son and the Father, as far as no one knows the Father. That means I don't know him, you don't know him, nobody knows him. None of the great preachers of the ages, none of the early church fathers, none of the prophets, nobody knew him except, and this is Jesus talking, I gotta give weight to his words. So he says that nobody knows the Father except the one that the Son chooses to reveal him to, and his very next word establishes the qualification. All who are weary and burdened. Isn't that amazing? It's a wide open gospel. Not because we're making it so theologically. Not because we've adjusted the narrowness of some of our reform thinking or anything like that. We're making, the gospel is wide open because Jesus has been sent and has chosen to reveal it. And the qualification is weariness. Just like the qualification to have the spirit poured out on you is having a flesh. <laughs> in all its glory.